David Henderson is a longtime friend and colleague of mine in the libertarian movement. Some of you may remember his articles in Reason and Libertarian Review. He was a delegate to the 1979 and 1981 National LP conventions, but he's also been uh, very successful as a, uh, an entrepreneur and an ideologue in the larger world. Um, I think you, I really regard him as an academic entrepreneur, somebody who's never stayed at one school long enough to get tenure and settle into a comfortable life, but keeps going out and doing interesting things in uh, journalism and uh, academics and government. Um, he's, I've been told by former students of his that he's a very good teacher. Um, I've seen his work in government. Um, most relevantly, I suppose, for today's speech, he was the energy economist on the staff of President Reagan's Council of Economic Advisors. And I don't know how much role he played in it, but you know, one of the few successes of the Reagan administration really was energy deregulation and then refusing to re-regulate at various times when it was suggested. David is currently a professor at the Naval Postgraduate School here in the Monterey area, uh, although it should be noted that whatever he says today does not represent, not necessarily represent the views of the Navy. I hope that will be obvious. Um, he also is a frequent uh, book reviewer for Fortune magazine. If you read the back of the book in Fortune, you will see his name frequently. Um, I remember particularly his review of Robert Higgs's book, Crisis and Leviathan. I cite Higgs's book frequently in my own writing, and I never turn back to the book. I just look at David's review, which is stuck in my copy, and it has all the essential details. So that always reminds me of what Higgs said. Um, he is currently editing a forthcoming book called The Fortune Encyclopedia of Economics, which will have articles by a number of distinguished economists. Uh, ranging from people like Robert Eisner on the left to Murray Rothbard on whichever direction that is, um, <laughs> with people like William Niskanen and Milton Friedman also included, so it should be a, a very interesting book. Uh, most relevantly for today's talk, he wrote an article in the Wall Street Journal last August on the uh, Saddam Hussein's oil weapon, the threat to Western oil prices and, and access to oil. Um, it got a lot of attention. It got an article in the Washington Post on the editorial page about the argument he was making. He was on CNN, other broadcast programs, um, and he has talked about this subject quite a bit since then. So it's a pleasure to introduce to you David Henderson. That's about one of the nicest introductions I've ever had. Thank you, David. Um, it's nice to be back uh, speaking before a libertarian audience. It's been a long time. It's, in fact, it's been, I think, about 10 years. And, and I noticed one big difference when I was here uh, for David's talk. Uh, whenever he made some joke about politicians, everyone laughed. You know? <laughs> and, and whenever he mentioned about you know, how the government doesn't provide things very well, produce things very well, people understood what that meant and why that's true. And, if there was a joke in there, they laughed. And, and, and I, I must say, I've felt lonely at times. Uh, um, and, and this reminds me, this, this, is, this is satisfying at least one part of my loneliness, being with people who, have, who, who see the humor uh, in, in the, many of the same things I see it in. I was watching the news a couple of months ago, just uh, local news, uh, local newscaster here. In, I, I live in Monterey, by the way. And uh, the, the newscaster was just announcing that Germany had said that day they were going to send a lot of food to the Soviet Union. And let me just try to imica imitate what the announcer said. He said, and the German government has announced that it, does, it fears the food getting into the wrong hands, so it, has been, it is having the food distributed by the KGB. <laughs> I mean, this man did not crack a smile. <laughs> And that was scary. Um, as David mentioned, I teach at the Naval Postgraduate School, right about 200 yards from here, actually. And uh, a, lot of mis a lot of preconceptions about military people bit the dust when I got there six and a half years ago. My, I mean, not the world's preconceptions, <laughs> my preconceptions. Uh, they're much more human, military officers, than you might think. In fact, they are totally human. Uh, they have concerns. They can be warm. 
And uh, for the, because of a lot of experiences I've had with them, I, have a, I, have a, I feel like I have a real personal stake in this, it, that I really don't want to see them killed. And, I know, and I'm, one, I'm waiting for the first announcement that someone who I taught was killed or captured. I think the odds are low, actually, but I know it could happen. I know that a number of my students are over there, especially my Marine students. Um, so that's kind of my own personal interest in this. Why are we at war? Well, President Bush and Secretary of State Baker made that very clear very early. That one of the main reasons we were at war was for oil. Let me quote. President Bush said on August 15th, that if Saddam gets greater control of oil reserves in the Middle East, he can threaten, quote, our jobs, unquote, and our way of life. How? By controlling the flow of oil and raising the price. He said in a guest article in Newsweek in November, our national security is at stake. Can the world afford to allow Saddam Hussein a stranglehold around the world's economic lifeline? That is exactly what would happen if we failed. Saddam would dominate the Gulf and the bulk of the world's petroleum reserves. Even now, without an actual shortage of oil, Saddam's aggression has almost doubled oil prices. Secretary of State Baker has said similar things. He said that Saddam, quote, could strangle the global economic order, determining by fiat whether we all enter a recession or even the darkness of a depression. And then on November 13th, Baker said, to bring it down, to the average American citizen. Thank you, Mr. Secretary. <laughs> Let me say that means jobs. If you want to sum it, that is the justification for intervening in the Middle East up in one word, it's jobs. And I assume he didn't mean his own. <laughs> so then let me ask the question, if Saddam were unchecked by the United States, could he impose large costs in our economy? Both Bush and Baker have said that he can. Economic analysis says, no way. First of all, one thing Saddam cannot do is cause a shortage, is cause us to line up for gasoline. Only the US government can do that. The U.S. government did that in 1973 and in 1979. How? By imposing price controls on oil and gasoline. They imposed price controls that kept the price from adjusting to reflect the lower supplies. As a result, people demanded more than was available, and we had lineups. People lining up sometimes for as much as two hours to get gasoline. Countries that avoided price controls Switzerland, West Germany, avoided lineups. It's even rumored that in 1973, service station attendants in Germany continued to wash windshields. <laughs> That's no surprise. It's no surprise that price controls cause shortages. And, that get, and just avoiding price controls means you, you don't have a shortage. Because if you avoid price controls and supplies fall, what happens? The price is bid up. People look at a higher price and make different decisions about how much oil and gasoline to use than they would have made at a lower price. They close off unused room. They uh, take fewer driving vacations. They combine trips to the store, and so on. And notice something interesting there. All of those examples I gave are adjustments people make on their own. No government policy is required to adjust to the higher price of oil. So the, the, there's, a, there's a lobby in Washington called the CAFE lobby. Ralph Nader is part of it. Other environmentalists are part of it. And they're pushing for a higher CAFE. Now, that's not something you drink in a coffee shop. That stands for corporate average fuel economy. And the idea is to require the auto companies 
to produce cars that get a higher average fuel economy. Now that's the kind of thing, higher average fuel economy, that would occur anyway if the price was expected to stay high. People would make those kinds of choices. But by requiring it, estimates are from a study done by an economist at Brookings and an economist at Harvard, that it will cost about 2,000 lives. It will kill 2,000 Americans. Because auto companies will respond to higher cafe by cutting the size of cars. And all other things equal, smaller cars are less safe than larger cars. Which incidentally, um, I, I did a piece on Ralph Nader for Barron's uh, a couple of years ago. And I managed to get to interview Nader directly on the phone. We ended up, it wasn't an interview, it was an, an hour and a half argument. <laughs> and I was trying to get him to admit that a smaller car is smaller than a large one. He certainly believed that when he trashed the Corvair. Uh, and he wouldn't, because he knew where I was going. And I tried to get Clarence Ditlow to do the same. And uh, if any of you are interested, uh, give me your card and I'll send you the, the result. I base Anyone who looks at it could see they admitted it. And D Ditlow finally said to me, when I, I said, do you think that a large, a small car isn't, is, is, is just as safe as a large car? And he said, a small car with an airbag is just as safe as a large car. And I said, a large car with an airbag? And then he said, you simply are not going to get me to admit that, that cafe kills people. Um, now, of course, Saddam does, doesn't have to cause gas lines to hurt our economy. If he cuts the supply of oil, that will hurt us. We are a net importer of oil. We import roughly half our oil, 8 million barrels a day. And just facing a higher price for something we buy hurts us. But the hurt is much smaller than most people think. Let's look at some numbers. And take what I think is the absolute worst case possible, which is that Saddam not only keeps Kuwait, but grabs Saudi Arabia and the United Arab Emirates. If he did that, he would control all oil production in the Middle East except for that of Iran. Well, that's 12, before the crisis, that was 12 million barrels a day. How much would Saddam produce after he grabbed it? <laughs> Who said that? Good answer. 12 million barrels a day is probably the best estimate. Why? Because there's already, you might think, well, if he grabbed it, the cartel would be strengthened. And on its face, that's plausible. I don't think it's true, though. Because the Saudis have always been what are called the price hawks in the OPEC cartel. The Saudis, our newfound allies, have always been the ones who wanted a higher price. And they argued for a lower price down to a, they all, they're, they're trying to keep it at $20 a barrel, roughly, because they have now come to realize that if, it, if it's above $20 per barrel for more than, say, half a year at a time, it will give people too strong an incentive to invest, to make long-term investments in other alternatives. And that will therefore reduce the value of those reserves in the future. So if Saddam is smart and no one anymore is saying that he's not, he would price it, he would produce the same amount of oil to set the price at the same level. And, and that means no impact on us. But I went further in my Wall Street Journal article. Uh, I said, Let's say he cuts output by a third. That seems pretty extreme. Let's say he cuts four million barrels a day. Well, that sounds like a lot, a third. But that's only 7% of world output. Now, if you cut output, you drive the price up. How much? To know that, you have to know the elasticity of demand. And it is true that oil is a good whose demand is very inelastic, which means, to translate that jargon, that a lower supply translates into a fairly high price. So I used Department of Energy estimates on elasticity to say what would be the effect on price. And doing that, it translates into a $10 increase. So we're talking $20 roughly before 
the crisis. $30 if he took over, remember, not just Kuwait, but United Arab Emirates and Saudi Arabia. How much would that cost the U.S.? $10 a barrel. Now we're into something that all those high school students could, could have learned if David had had his way with education. It's multiplication. $10 a barrel, 8 million barrels a day, 365 days in a year. It works out to $29 billion. $29 billion every year. That's not small change. But we've got to say, I mean, to say whether it's large or small, we have to compare it with something. Well, let's do a couple of comparisons. The U.S. gross national product is $5.4 trillion. So $29 billion is a half of a percent of our gross national product. A half of a percent. For, the, for, for per person, it would cost $112 per year. It doesn't sound big. It doesn't sound, if someone said our, our, our GNP fell by half a percent, you wouldn't say, oh my God, we're being thrown into a depression. It just, that's just not so. And let's do another comparison, because it's not as if we can just snap our fingers and stop Hussein, we know that. So let's compare the cost per year with the cost of our military action. The cost of that, latest estimates are for, the, for, th for just three months, the three months of the war in which, they think, in which time they think they can win it, $56 billion. Now granted, you're comparing, well, let me not, not granted. Let me tell you the argument that a bunch of economists have made against me, and then I'll tell you my response. They've said, look, you're comparing a one-time expenditure, $56 billion, with $29 billion a year. So 56 billion looks smaller if you take the present value of that 29 billion annuity. And if that were it, if it were that simple, that would be right. But it's not that simple. Because if you stop Hussein, you aren't just going to leave. Baker has said this. We're going to have a permanent military presence in the Gulf. And that will cost something. Moreover, let's look back at some history. Not that ancient history, to use Jimmy Carter's term some history about the Carter administration. Jimmy Carter was so upset by what was happening in the Persian Gulf and by his inability to control things that he put together something called the Rapid Deployment Force, the explicit purpose of which was to go to places like the Middle East, mainly the Middle East, in the event of a crisis. The Rapid Deployment Force was transformed in the Reagan administration, same goal, just different name, into something called CENTCOM. CENTCOM's budget, according to Earl Ravenall, is about $46 billion a year. And remember, the whole purpose of it, or the almost, enti the, almost the whole purpose of it, was to be able to handle these kinds of things. So now we're comparing an annuity and an annuity, and which one's bigger? I want to say something else at this point because I want to, um, sometimes you'll hear analyses like this and they make sense and you just, and you think, well, why can't other people see this? Why can't, you know, why can't other economists see this? Well, there's no, you don't have to, you don't have to ask that. Other economists do see it. Jonathan Marshall uh, wrote, an, he's the economics editor for the San Francisco Chronicle, wrote an article uh, in uh, the San Francisco Chronicle um, about my piece that Cato put out, a longer version of my Wall Street Journal article, and he interviewed James Tobin, a liberal economist at Yale who won the Nobel Prize a few years ago, and Milton Friedman, a libertarian economist at the Hoover Institution. And he quoted, he said, here's what Henderson found, what do you say? Tobin stated, there are other ways of coping with 30 or $40 a barrel oil than going to war. The ultimate loss to a $5.5 trillion economy is less than 1%. It's hard to say we should go to war to save 1% of GNP. Sound familiar? I want to take a little credit for that. I had called Tobin and tried to get him to sign a petition uh, on this issue, and he, I sent him copies of my analysis, and we, we talked about it, and he seemed convinced. 
uh, Friedman said, Henderson's analysis is correct. There is no justification for intervention on grounds of oil. Friedman stated further that Saddam's revenue maximizing price, quote, would be higher than a competitive price, but not that much higher, and certainly not enough to justify what we are doing in the Middle East. I want to say, by the way, in case anyone takes the wrong message from here, Friedman favors war. He's real clear on that. But as far as is there an economic justification, the title of my talk is do we, know, do we need to go to war for oil? The answer is no. I'm saying no. He says no. He favors it on other grounds. Uh, another thing that I just came across this week, the International Monetary Fund put out a study in October with estimates very similar to mine of the cost of that amount of oil to the economy. So it's, it's really not even that controversial. I was actually, I mean, I'll take some credit here. I was just the person who sat down and said, what do the numbers look like? No one else had done that. Now, there's a related issue um, that comes up. Bob Samuelson, who's a very sharp uh, economics columnist for Newsweek, uh, wrote a piece on this issue. And he said, well, it's not really an issue of the price. We don't, you know, that kind of analysis is, is right. He quoted William Scannon of the Cato Institute with a similar analysis to mine. But he said, the problem is availability. If Saddam took over all that oil, he'd stop us from getting it. Uh-uh. We learned that in 1973. In 1973, OPEC embargoed the Netherlands and the United States. They said, we will not sell oil to the Netherlands and the United States. So what happened? Wow, good. <laughs> oil is fungible, which means what? It means they sold it to other people, and it was resold to the United States. <laughs> you cannot impose a selective embargo on oil. It cannot be done. And in fact, what happened was you sell, you know, think of how the oil market works. You sell oil to someone, it, he, 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 someone say in, in England, that person owns title to it, puts it in the tanker, it's, it's crossing the ocean, and then transfers title. It doesn't have to come somewhere else, it just keeps coming straight to the United States. And in fact, the ownership of a tank load of oil often changes uh, hands a number of times while it's being shipped. Um, now, uh, I want to go back to that quote from Bush also because there's something else that's really, it, the Americans, American public is being misled a lot on this and I just think it's important to set it straight. Uh, and unfortunately here, I, although I think Michael Boskin, um, who is Bush's chairman of the Council of Economic Advisors, is a first-rate economist and a, he's very good. Uh, he's been not completely forthcoming on, 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 on this item. Let me just read that quote from Bush again, who said, even now, without an actual shortage of oil, Saddam's aggression has almost doubled oil prices. Saddam's aggression? Who imposed the embargo? <laughs> the United Nations. The, United, the embargo is what increased oil prices because the embargo was not a selective embargo. It said Iran, Iraq and Kuwait cannot sell oil. So it, it reduced the world supply and that drove up the price. Now that was one of, the, one of the things driving up the price. The Saudis though picked up their production and made up for most of the, most of the reduction in supply. Nevertheless, the price was higher. What else drove it up? Fear of war. Well, <laughs> takes two to tango, takes two to have a war. Saddam's aggression, which was war, it was war in Kuwait, but it was resolved, isn't what drove up, isn't what caused the fear of war. It was, it was Bush's statement that we're willing to go to war. And the, the price of oil on the futures market rises every time it looks like the war will last and falls every time it looks like the war will be resolved quickly because it's very hard to produce oil when there's fighting around the oil wells. Uh, and just so, so I can explain what I meant about Michael Boskin, Michael Boskin was on, um, I'm, I'm a C-SPAN junkie sometimes, 
and he was on talking to the National Press Club, and he just made you know, a very casual statement that that the that the uh, something like Bush's that the, that Saddam's uh, you know, aggression has has uh, has caused the price of oil to go up, and I think he knows that that's not true. Um, now, if I I've basically covered what the, what the title of my talk was about. Do we need to go to war for oil? And my answer is no. Uh, and I guess I could stop, but um, uh, I would like to get into some of the, the bigger issues, if I have time. Do I have time? OK. There are other arguments that have been made for war. One is that the added oil wealth that Saddam has grabbed from Kuwait will make him well, wealthier and therefore more dangerous. And by the way, I totally agree with that argument. He will be wealthier and more dangerous. But how much more? Again, let's look at numbers. The GNP of Iraq before the war was $60 billion. That is 1% of ours. It is one-fifth of our defense budget. The GNP of Iraq, if they'd kept Kuwait and been able to just go on producing oil and not fighting, would have been an extra 30, $13 billion more per year. So then it would have been one and a third percent of ours. Now, if he grabbed Saudi Arabia and the United Arab Emirates, it would have been an extra, and, then, and also raised the price, it would have been an extra 70, 80, 90, 100 billion. So then it would have been 4% of ours. I mean, the idea that somehow this guy is going to be like another superpower is absurd. And let me also say that it, you, I don't think it's a good argument to say added oil wealth makes someone dangerous and that justifies going to war with them. Imagine the following. Imagine that, because what we're, I gave an example where he, where he say uh, quadruples GNP. Well, imagine that he quadrupled GNP with a laissez-faire economy, which would happen over time, but, but also had this predilection to invade other countries at the same time and do all these crazy things on the military side, well, would we say, hey, you, you, you start a laissez-faire economy, we're going to zap you? I mean, is that how it would work? Now, the other argument, or sorry, another argument that has been made, and it's, it's the other one that Bush has emphasized, uh, and I think it is the strongest argument, is that this guy aggressed against another country, he violated their rights incredibly, and we've got to say to the world, you can't get away with that kind of thing. And that's what this is about. And let me just say, I, I've, I'll, I'll, I'll be totally honest here, I've gone back and forth on this myself, on, on whether that's a good enough argument. So I can, I can tell you my, my thinking of the last 24 <laughs> well, I'll tell you all my thinking, but, but my bottom line of the last 24 hours and by the way, I want to I state the best case I can, and Bush didn't say it as well as Tom Hazlett said it in a forthcoming Reason article in the April issue. And Tom gave me permission to quote this. If there is a minimum civilized bound, you've got to say Saddam Hussein has crushed it. Here, the world has both abundant cause and abundant ability. If we look away here, we look away anywhere. The line surrounding acceptable conduct has been terribly stretched in this century but now a line can be drawn around Saddam Hussein. If the world can't deal some justice out of this hand, there's no point in reshuffling. Just leave the table quietly. Failure to respond to this test case of incoming barbarity sends back a very clear signal to the world's crazies huddled in the, mid in the Middle East. Anything goes. The world has no insanity defenses in place. I'm not so sure that's wrong. I think it might be a, a signal that as far as the United States, if, if we didn't go over there, that as far as the United States is concerned, we're saying that's not our business. But here's my problem with that argument. It's acting like there's only one other country in the world besides Iraq, and that is the United States. Take a look at the globe, and everyone's been doing that lately. And by the way, I forgot to bring it, but I was going to hold up a picture of uh, the Middle East and, tell, and see if the person halfway back in the room could show me, could tell with normal eyesight where you could see Kuwait. <laughs> it's, 
if you, if you start thinking what countries are threatened by Iraq, by a more powerful Iraq, and how much is the threat, it's hard to find a country that's safer than ours. <laughs> I was at, a, at the Cato Symposium on this last month, and there was a British uh, journalist from the Financial Post on, on, the, on the, ah, Bill, can you see Iraq, or can you see Kuwait? Raise it up a little, Bill. Well, if you look at the Persian Gulf, it's right at the end, <laughs> on the left. Um, Where was I? Oh, the British columnist. And he said, you know, these things are so abstract to Americans because they don't really deal with it. They're, we're not really going to have planes taken out by this. All this stuff in the, in the airports is really nonsense. Whereas in Europe, people really do have this happen. And he pointed out that London is much closer to Baghdad than Los Angeles is to Washington, DC. You know, that, that's where it's happening. So it's really hard to make a case that there's a vital interest of the United States there. It doesn't mean that there's, a, that there's not a strong case against making war with Saddam Hussein. And I think other countries would do it. And they wouldn't do it necessarily. And, I, and by the way, I want to thank David. David and I were talking about this at some length last night, David Bowes. And, and I was thinking, well, you know, Saudi Arabia has 35,000 troops. Saddam Hussein has a million. I mean, how could they handle it? Well, David taught me an economics lesson about incentives. Why does Saudi Arabia have 35,000 troops? Because they know that the United States will defend them if anything happens. And so yes, I guess it's conceivable in the short run you could lose, that, that, that Saddam could take over Saudi Arabia and maybe, maybe a couple of other countries. But what a signal that would send to the world uh, to any other people expecting the United States to defend them. Consider the alternative which is what we have now, where we say, hey, this is a new world order. Okay? This is a statement. We're not just making a statement about what, about what we're going to do to Saddam Hussein. We're saying, here's what we'll do if this kind of thing happens anywhere. That's been Bush's whole thing, that we're trying to make a stand, trying to make a statement. Well, the statement is totally uncredible if you just single out Hussein and don't ever go anywhere else. People will pick that up pretty quickly, too, with the next invasion of some other country. So what it means is the United States is taking on a commitment to do this again and again and again. And it's just hard to see why that's why our taxpayers should be burdened with that. Um, how about the fact of Saddam's terrorism? And clearly he is a terrorist. Well, again, why single out that one? Look at, look at what Assad, the dictator of Syria, is doing. He's taking over Lebanon. He is on the US government's official list of terrorists. And he is now a US government ally. In what? In what George Bush has called a battle of good versus evil, black versus white. <laughs> now, there are more emotional arguments that get used for war. And one was made, there's a woman who writes for the New Wall Street Journal, Dorothy Rabinowitz, and she's very sharp, and I like a lot of what she writes. But this one I didn't. She said that uh, she was an article on the POWs and the war protesters and how until the POWs came along, the war protesters were getting all the coverage. And she quoted Senator McCain from Arizona as saying that the treatment of the POW should convince all anti-war advocates to favor the war. Huh? Let me get this straight. Seeing US officers on TV who were obviously abused by their captors is what's supposed to want us to, to, to favor war? We should like, I mean, we, that's a good thing? I mean, that wouldn't have happened if we hadn't gone to war. 
I mean, it's, it's really strange. In short, there's a slight case for war, but I don't think it's nearly strong enough. Now, this is the point in a talk where some speakers would say, but even though we should have not gotten the war, I support the president, I support our troops, and we must close ranks and see this through to the end. I'm not going to say that. <laughs> Instead, my position is this. Oh, and by the way, I want to say that I do support the troops. Tom Hazlett, who wrote that article I quoted in favor of war, was, was joshing me the other day on the phone. He said, don't you support our troops? And I said, I support every one of them. I want them all home alive. My position is this. We should get out of Saudi Arabia tomorrow. And we should disband the part of our military we'd already set up for dealing with crises in the Gulf so that this doesn't happen again. Yes. Thank you. I don't want to disband the whole military. Yes, George. By the way, I want to say you're welcome, and, and thank you for saying that. And uh, but my question is, what do you think we're really there for? <laughs> uh, I, okay, I don't know, because I'm not in George Bush's mind, okay? But hell, I can speculate, right? <laughs> uh, uh, I think it's bait and switch. You know what bait and switch is? Someone says, I've got this great deal, come down, look at it. You already have made the co taken, taken the time to come down. You look at it, it isn't there, and he tries to sell you something else. If you look at the emphasis on oil in the first month, if you look at reasons, the, the emphasis was on the oil reason. However, and it was real interesting, I, I got on CNN, uh, the Washington Post wrote a whole editorial around my piece making the same point. Three days after my piece appeared, CNN had me on the next day, and Jordan, James Baker testified the day after. And... Uh, uh, they really started, that was about when they started downplaying the oil thing, the oil reason. And for a while it became reason of the week. You know, what, what is it this week? And what George Bush has settled on, and by the way, I think he believes this, I don't, I don't think it's dishonest, is the aggression against Kuwait and how we've got to make a stand against aggression. But I don't think that he felt he could sell it to the American public on those grounds alone. Now he can. There's this, there's this kind of, there's a real inertia when it comes to, to, to war. People tend to get on the bandwagon once it's started. And now he can emphasize aggression. I think that was the reason all along. Uh, Alice. Uh, I might have a suggestion. Uh-huh. Uh, you're supposed to put that something to do with the fact that uh, the Americans are going to be Um, David Bowes, by the way, had wrote an editorial saying something like that, and, and I, well, I don't, maybe I won't have a job to go back to, but um, I think there's a lot to that. Uh, if you look at who really was pushing hard for war, it was Colin Powell. Who? Colin Powell, head of the Joint Chiefs of Staff. He had a war plan ready to go. Excuse me, I, this is really distracting. Would you mind? Okay. He had a war plan ready to go within hours of the takeover. So he was set for it. Now, I, I mean, that in itself isn't enough evidence because I'd want my, if, if we really were threatened, I'd want my soldiers to have plans ready too for various eventualities. But, I mean, I don't think we're ever going to know. I mean, I don't think Colin Powell knows. You know what I mean? I mean, it would take a lot of honesty, a lot of real self-value, self, a real self-look to know. 
what we can say is that that is the effect. The effect is the peace dividend is now gone, and uh, and who knows longer term. Uh, that's, there was a guy, but yes, you back the back. You had your hand up longest. You. Uh, he said basically the same argument as the one I quoted from Tom Hazlett. Good question. I, if I were you, I'd ask people who, who make that argument. I'd, I'd really like to know the answer. Yes. Uh, you and then you afterwards. Okay. By half. Yeah. Uh, by the way, my Wall Street Journal numbers are a little off. I did them on an airplane when I, when I was away to Canada to, for a holiday, and I didn't have the numbers so handy. Increase the price by 50%. Right. Yeah, I don't think so. Well, with my estimates of elasticity, no, it wouldn't pay them to. to they, they could make a lot of money at 10, but they could make more at 20 and, and even more at 30. But, but let me just also say that even, see, the other thing, and again, it's a reasonable argument, I just don't think it's right, that if he took over all that oil, he could make a lot more money than he's making now by cutting output way back and driving up the price to 50. And that's true. He could. But I'm saying he could make even more money by selling it at 30. Yes? Yes. Uh, your analysis said $29 million a year. Uh, how do you think, and that would assume a limited age of perpetuity, but uh, I'm sure yeah. the second law of demand would take over pretty quickly and reduce price. So I thought maybe you could give your comments on, on that. Good. I'm glad you raised that. It was part of my prepared talk, and I didn't look at my notes much, so I forgot to. What he was saying was that $29 billion is the cost the first year, but it's going to be lower the second year. Because over time, there are more possibilities for substitution. You might just drive your car a little less now, but when it comes time to get a new car, say two years from now, you're going to make a different decision. We are still, by the way, adjusting. We are still in our long-run adjustment to the increase of the price of oil in 1973, because buildings last 50 or 60 years. And we're still in that process. Buildings, our old building stock dies, and new ones are much more energy efficient. So we would go 29 billion, something less than 29, something less than that, and so on over the years. Uh, and I haven't really worked it out, because I get skeptical the longer out it gets. My guess would be the present value of the cost to us um, would be uh, 200 billion. No. Yeah. Yes. Uh, well, John, you've had your hand up. Um, we understand uh, that uh, Saddam had this conversation with April Blasby on the uh, yes. uh, 26th of July, and that basically uh, Congressman Lee Hamilton asked the same questions of Under Secretary of State John Kelly, Kelly. on the 31st of July, mm -hmm. given basically the same answers. Uh, do, do you want me to read you her answer, by the way? Okay. I have in that connection is, do you think that uh, that Mr. Bush set a little trap for Saddam because he wanted the war? No. Uh, 
April Glaspie, who was the UN amb U.S. ambassador to Iraq, met with Saddam. He, he called her over there on July 25th, a uh, week before invading. And he, they were talking about this and that. And here's what she said. This was the transcript that the Iraqs, Iraqis uh, released, and the U.S. government has not questioned its accuracy. We have no, this is her, this is her talking to him. We, the United States government, have no opinion on the Arab-Arab conflicts like your border disagreement with Kuwait. That's what she said. And James Kelly said something similar a few days later to Congress. So he was told, you've got the green light. Uh, but no, I don't think, I think it's, uh, it's a classic example of central planning. You know, foreign policy is the ultimate in central planning. You can't keep track of everything at the same time. And, and the, way the, the way the media and the pundits put it was Kuwait was off Baker's radar screen. He wasn't looking at that one, and it just happened. Uh, yes? Uh, there's an argument. You're next. I'm, I'm sorry. Okay. Uh, there's an argument that one of the best things that could possibly have happened to the country was, in fact, that he took over all the oil, raised it to $50, embargoed us, and then we would finally do what we should have done at least 20 years ago, if not 50 years ago, which is either, if the government was going to stay involved, put in place sensible long-term policies, or better yet, the government get totally out of the energy price suppression business and let us develop all of the indigenous, alternate, and conventional energy sources and not have to import a single drop of oil, which we're perfectly capable of doing because we have one of the largest coal deposits in the world, we have oil shale, we have adequate solar, geothermal, wind, uranium, uh, uh, natural gas, and hydro. Let me give you a couple of numbers, and let me, and let me take issue with one of the things you said. The uh, Arlen Twissing and Samuel Van Vactor claim that they're energy economists in Seattle, and by the way, they've had a very good track record, unlike most energy economists in the late 70s and early 80s at predicting oil prices. Uh, most people were predicting, if, if, by the way, just to put the price in perspective, the price now, the highest it made it, I believe, in the last few months was $38 a barrel. And uh, $38 a barrel, well, the high, it reached a price as high as uh, $52 a barrel in today's dollars in 1981. So we've been there before. Uh, but they, Tussing and Van Vactor estimate that at a price much above $20 a barrel, there would be a lot of these long-term irreversible investments in energy alternatives. And the main one isn't all the exotic stuff. It's natural gas. It's there. It's cheap. It's plentiful. Uh, according to the Oil and Gas Journal, uh, reserves of natural gas outside the U.S. and Canada were equivalent to 80 years of production by the end of 1989. Throughout the 80s, additions to natural gas reserves were three times annual production. And it's used in almost all the areas where oil is used. It's a great substitute. Utilities now use half, use less than half of the oil they use to produce electricity that they used back in 1973. They're using less than half of that now. But I don't think they did us a favor with, it, but with the higher price of oil. It's always good to get something cheap. And, and you know, it's like saying, I, you know, you know, the, the, the neighborhood grocer raises his price, and I go to, you know, I, so I don't go to him, I go to Safeway, and I say, God, thank you. You know, I've just been putting off going to Safeway, but now you've given me the reason. Uh-uh. The reason I was going to the neighborhood grocer was that he was cheaper or better or something. I liked him better, and by raising the price, he's made me worse off. So it's not a favor, but you're absolutely right that we do have these alternatives. The, the, the strangulation of the U.S. economy is not at issue here. Uh, I promised, uh, yes. <laughs> Do you have any comment on or expl explanation for uh, Reason Magazine's apparent willingness to serve as a mouthpiece for the Bush administration? <laughs> well, you know, it's funny. I, 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 I sympathize with Virginia Postrel because, uh, well, actually, I'll, can I tell you that the story, David, about your, what you said to me last night? No, no, about what you said to me about my position. Okay, well, okay, okay. Well, I'm not going to get it. Let me just say that if I had had to give this speech at about 2 o'clock yesterday afternoon, I would have said something like what she said. You know, I, I think it's, a, it, it's, you know, it's, it's been a tough issue for me to figure out where I stand. Except that one thing I would not have said, in case you didn't read it, 
By the way, I haven't yet, <laughs> going with what David quoted to me. She said that, well, on the one hand, there are all these good arguments in favor of war. On the other hand, there are all these good arguments against war. And I don't know which way I come down, so I guess I'll support the president. Well, I'd go the opposite way, you know. <laughs> I, I, if, if on the one hand there are these good arguments in favor of something, and on the other hand there are these good arguments against something, this is, this is the voters' rule, by the way. California voters follow it all the time with initiatives. You vote no. If you aren't sure, you vote no. Um, yeah. Okay. Well, thank you. Thank you. Thanks.